e text workshop class panel for hanging out course of um, video printing. So, so um, I'm Mitchell Dumlau. I'm the CMO, um, do marketing and sales, and the videos for um, Easy Tech. Ray, our CEO, uh, US UI designer, software engineer, and then David Rodriguez, also known as Joey. We'll be referring to Joey, it's a long story. But uh, he um, is our CTO. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and aerospace engineer, USC grad, a oh, in grad school right now. So together we make Easy Tech. Easy Tech is an online e commerce platform for drone, uh, 3D printers, drones, and leading edge technologies. And so we uh, focus on a very seamless user experience for our website as well as digital content to help um, market um, our products as well as educate our users. And today we're going to be talking about just the basics of 3D printing and possibilities and opportunities and also we're going to have a 3D printing going on right here with the Upmini, which is one of our products. This is an idea for the F100. But we are actually uh, raffling or going to be giving you guys a uh, 3D printing object today. And so we're actually going to give you number two. <laughs> we voted <laughs> for you. <laughs> it's not really. We made it. We made it. We made it. We're going to build, build this right here. But these are the things that uh, you can create with uh, three pairs. And this is off the thingy verse. So, um, one of the biggest uh, questions that we have is how do we make 3D models? Because people don't have CAD backgrounds and they feel like that's like a barrier for a lot of people. There are a lot of um, online marketplaces for 3D models and um, files that people create and they post up for free. And it's MakerBot's um, uh, website. MakerBot is a well known brand for 3D printers, and this is their marketplace for 3D printed models. So um, you can go online and just download, and, and then you can also modify. So there isn't really, you don't really need to have a background in CAD. There are a lot of programs out there which we'll talk about today. But, um, you know, so we're going to be printing this awesome little iPhone stand, as you can see right here. But uh, yeah, so as I put that out, our lovely CEO and CTO will take it away, guys. All right, thanks for the show. So you can actually have a confession. Yeah, there you go. It's not useful. Any size. Any size, yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. It's coming out of the table, too. Yeah, right. That's it. The question is, how do you take a picture of that now when your phone's in it? Oh no. Where would yours? Where's yours? Mine. No, I have a six plus. This is just a six. Maybe it only oh. works with larger phones. Thinner? Thinner? We can fix it. No, we, 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 can, we can put, yeah. we can put a yeah. little bit tired on there. Yeah. Oh, this is my phone. That's what we do here. So there's multiple applications for 3D printing, right? So there's film, fashion, art, healthcare, automotive, and food. And uh, we'll actually go one by one and, and really go depth into detail what type of applications and uh, the type of uh, benefits that 3D printing does for different uh, applications here. First, we should watch and talk about film. That's a specialty. So with film, um, a lot of people uh, are using film I um, mean, you can for prototyping, for a lot of uh, set design, um, props, to even um, costumes, Iron Man, um, monsters, you name it. Now also with stop motion. Now stop motion animation is like claymation. Uh, the uh, animation studio Leica up in Portland, they created Paranorman, um, Boss Trolls, Coraline, and they 3D print a lot of their, um, all their actually uh, models. And so uh, now a lot of people are using these um, 3D printers on movie sets. And it's just easier for people to kind of create um, props and, um, and uh, everything they need to kind of create, like, you know, just movies. Um, so here are some Iron Man examples right here. So this was actually 3D printed uh, in metal. And uh, it, it was amazing because. Have you, do you guys see what uh, Robert Downey Jr. did this week? He actually gave a bionic arm 
uh, to a kid, uh, of course, doesn't have an arm, and, and uh, it was a big deal because this kid was a huge Iron Man fan, and Robert Downey Jr. was a full character, an Iron, you know, as an Iron Man, and he was wearing his arm too, right? And uh, it was just all it, it, it really brought a lot of joy to that kid who uh, was a huge fan of Iron Man. 3D printing is also important in fashion, right? Uh, nowadays, you'll see um, materials such as PLA, nylon, get used uh, as a material to create new designs for fashion. So uh, in this case, Francis Bittoni designed a 3D printed um, outfit for a Dina Von Teese, and uh, 3D printing in uh, the fashion industry was really blown when we first saw this. Um, the cool thing about nylon is that it's, it's highly flexible, um, it's, it's very, uh, it's a stretch material in short, for short, right? Um, and it really, and you can build it and tailor it to really uh, tailor uh, any specific body type. And uh, in this day and age where people really want uh, custom made products and personable products, uh, 3 printing delivers these kinds of, uh, you know, it, it meets people's expectations, right? Um, and, we'll, and we'll go into, into, into more depth as we go into healthcare, right? and you'll see different kinds of uh, ways where 3 printing actually helps uh, people. So in art, um, 3 printing is really, really making huge ways in, uh, in the art industry. Um, artists, uh, who, you know, you know, beforehand they would usually just build, you know, uh, using their own hands, whether that's painting, uh, sculpture, or, uh, or some sort of digital format. You now create complex objects uh, with the use of any kind of CAD, uh, parametric or non-parametric software. You really create complex objects, which you see here. It's not as long. It's not as long. It's the initializing, so you get to see yeah. three printing in action. Oh, yeah. So we're going to three-print something for you guys live. No. You get to take a paper out. Or you going to What's that? The paper? Yeah, after have to calibrate. So um, previously, where complex objects were initial, were hard for artists to uh, create by hand, 3D printing gives you that kind of complexity that you know no one's ever seen before. Um, you know when people would, when artists would create these things by hand, right? In a lot of ways, complexity is actually a lot easier for 3D printers because there's a lot of missing layers that don't necessarily have to print, right? So that base actually I think took longer than the T-Rex to print, right? Although the T-Rex still actually looks more complicated, but it uses a lot less material. Um, the more complex it is, uh, the more clear it looks, of course, by default. Um, but more importantly, there's also less waste that gets created, right? Um, when artists would create, the, at least that's even attempt to create these objects, would also be a lot of byproducts, a lot of waste. Um, in 3D printing, uh, we hardly you know, have any waste. There are a few exceptions to different kinds of materials that you use. Um, and Joe will get more in depth on the material types. Any questions so far? Um, yes, it says artists are creating sounds. Yes, so um, what, what happens is that now we have artists that's able to capture sound frequencies, right? And they'll actually create visualizations for those, like 3D visualizations for those sound frequencies. Kind of like sound waves. Yeah. So now uh, we were at a tech conference, a uh, theory conference, and an artist would actually uh, capture just noises and then create that into a wave, into a visual thing yeah. wave, and then print it. And so let's say this is how the sound of a dog barking. Oh, so it's not, you don't hear anything. It's just a visualization of the sound. But you can, kind of, you can actually uh, print your own speakers as well. Yeah. So in that, in, that, in that space. So you print out like a case for the speakers, right? Mm -hmm. And print your own box. Not just the case, the actual speaker itself too. So you can print out the speaker, but it can't play the sound. It, 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 it can play it if you if you modify it with the electronics of the speaker, but you can print everything else. Right? You, you can still have to buy the electronic part, but everything else you can still print. But you, you won't play the sound that you will play it. It will play it, no. Okay, that's what I was talking about. You know, visualizing yeah. sounds, we're printing the sounds, and we're printing the speaker that oh. plays the visualized sound. Right, so, so I, I know what you're saying. It's yeah. like, uh, yeah. you're not necessarily printing the sound. You're not, <laughs> <laughs> you're not getting there. Uh, um, you're not necessarily printing the sound, right? What, what we're trying to say is that in, in, in applications for art, right? You know, you, you see, you know, sound, sound frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can visualize that, and that visualization can be three D printed, okay. as opposed to but it won't be. Yeah. It, 
what he's trying to say is that in Ken, yes, the Ken name sound, when you print out the box, the casing for the sound. Yeah, yeah, it won't print out the sound like the auditory, you know, the like, uh, yeah. you know, the experience, experience, but it'll print out the, the box that you can make, that you use for the computer itself. Um, so, print printing is really important in healthcare too now. Um, so, you can see that in the picture, um, doctors have used uh, print printed skull for, the, for a heavily injured patient, right? And uh, this patient got in a, in a very uh, new and tragic head, head trauma accident. They, they couldn't salvage the skull. So, what the doctors do, they just 3D printed the skull. Um, I believe it's using a combination of nylon and, and some sort of biodegradable. Uh, um, it's not biodegradable. It's not biodegradable? No. Okay, yeah, why is it biodegradable? Sorry. Oh, but the thing is, the material decision. It's nylon it's and. It's nylon and. I don't forget. How do you send them tough? So they. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah. tough. Yeah, it's tough. The body has to, uh, like, you can't just put a foreign object in it. Right. But it has to be compatible. It has to be compatible, otherwise, it would reject it more than ever. Right. Yeah, so the doctors have to test this. Uh, PET G. Sorry. PETG. PETG. Very nice. That's right. It should be the same. I mean, is it that they could put in foreign objects and what? So they just use the same materials as, you know, something else that they. So they can't do that. They can't do that because it has to be physical. Right? And we'll, 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 we'll go in that. We'll go in the material aspect later. Uh, it has to be something that the uh, human body doesn't want to reject. Right, something that doesn't corrode because of the acidity or pH levels of, of uh, the blood in the system, right? So it gets pretty complex. Yeah. And uh, you know, again, pre-printing is really customization of you know, parts or any kind of objects. Uh, this this uh, lady here, she has a uh, multiple sclerosis, and uh, this brace is actually you know pretty pretty exactly for her own body shape, as opposed to like you know using some sort of cast which would actually be bulky and heavy. Now, you can use materials for 3D printing that are extremely light, that are, that are also extremely uh, stronger, much stronger actually than the typical cast. Um, here, you can see a 3D printed ear. Um, it's also for using PETG, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's amazing because like people who uh, would not have, uh, who were born with like some sort of physical defects, um, can now uh, blend in you know, with society and, and like really conform to you. Through the benefits of 3D printing, um, cast, uh, you know, 3D printing and cast have also been big. And uh, the cool thing too is that it's also light; it's not burdensome, and it really conforms to, to the person's uh, body shape. And you can wash whatever is kind of covering. Because the major thing with the cast is you can't wash it. It's not breathable. It's not exactly breathable. Uh, in, in, in a cast like this, it's very breathable and it's lightweight. In, in a lot of ways, it looks like fashion, right? Yeah. It doesn't look like, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, check it out. Yeah, yeah, love, right? Um, so, you know, and so far, we've only really gotten up to healthcare. Like, this this is my model, this 3D printing is like, we're, we're kind of in the early stages of 3D printing. Um, in the same vein, how uh, you know, computers back in the 80s were making headway, uh, 3D printing is, is, you know, kind of in the same kind of uh, stage right now. 3D printing has huge applications in the automotive industry. Uh, this is the first set of 3D printed car uh, by a company called Local Motors. Uh, it's an R&D shop. Uh, all they do is build cool stuff out in Arizona. And uh, it was demoed actually in, uh, at the North American Auto Show. And uh, this utilized a 3D printer that was uh, that was really big, right? But it's a, it's a multi-piece car, so it wasn't necessarily printed as a one piece. And uh, it's also it's using some uh, some sort of polymer plastic. I forget which one. I think it's ABS. And as you can see, it's got an engine. It's fully functional. It, uh, you can drive it, right? You can also create um, pre-printed uh, intake manifolds, uh, exhaust manifolds, not exhaust manifolds, intake manifolds, and different other car objects, uh, utilizing a metal 3D printer. And here, this wheel that you see here is a uh, 3D printed Aston Martin uh, wheel. Uh, it's great because you can actually prototype a lot of these ideas that the engineers and designers will come up with without really uh, sucking in a lot of cost and get go uh, without utilizing the printers. Mitchell? So, um, food right now is actually a big thing because uh, a lot of people are, of course, uh, Going crazy over the chocolate 3D printers. There's also 3D printed pastas. 
Um, at the past CD, I showed the three printed a pizza. Um, and so, it's oh, kind pizza. of a whole pizza. So, this is kind of a, a big a, uh, industry right now just because of customizable um, artis artisan um, kind of uh, foods. So, uh, people want to make uh, chocolates, um, baked goods, um, ice cream cakes, cakes, and you know, sooner or later, you're going to have, of course, the meats, the breads. Cheeses, and you kind of think about it as these two right here, which is called filaments. And it's basically just creating a tube like material that has this, this food material to be able to melt it and create three different objects. Um, and so, uh, right now, you know, they're, they've got these printers out right now, and we just talked about it before how one of our um, potential manufacturers and partners uh, has a chocolate tea printer, and we'll be you know, carrying that on our platform pretty soon. So we will both show this quick video of how uh, the printed chocolate gets done. both of these printers that we have up here. They're called Fuse Deposition Modeling Printers. Uh, so this chocolate is either already in liquid form or it's being heated past its liquefaction temperature. And so it'll actually uh, cool, and when it does cool, it hardens. You can pick it up off the food safe plastic that it's printing on top of, and then serve it as you'd like. So you can create this pattern at home on your, on your CAD model or, or, or uh, download it from somewhere else and then really just customize like whatever chocolate you'd like if you know if you want to give it to your significant other as a present and it's their name or something right so the cool thing too is that um, you know you can now create custom chocolates you know or even uh, at some point any kind of food um, to your significant other or your loved ones and say like yeah I made this for you and it has your name you don't have to custom order through through C's where you have to have a three month lead time. You can create one month. Yeah, it's about three months. Um, and you can have it actually uh, you know, get it done you know, within, within less than a day, depending on the quantity of, uh, and complexity of the, uh, of the chocolate you want to uh, have done. Okay, cool. So now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts and of how 3D printing works. Uh, for us, there's three major types of 3D printers. It's uh, fused deposition modeling, uh, FDM for short. These two that you see up front use uh, fused deposition modeling techniques. Uh, there's also stereolithography uh, that uh, we'll talk about later. It's a little different. It doesn't use a plastic like this. It uses a resin that cures later. Uh, and then there's also a direct laser metal sintering, right? So that's how you make your metal parts. Uh, for fused deposition modeling, uh, it was mentioned earlier that MakerBot and 3D systems are, you know, uh, uh, the most popular. Uh, when someone thinks of a 3D printer, uh, right now they associate that with the MakerBot brand. Uh, with stereolithography, the major player right now is actually Formlabs. Uh, we'll talk about them as well later. But uh, really quickly, I want to. Uh, mention what kind of metallic structures you can make with this, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure you have some questions. So, rocket engines. This is a working rocket engine made by SpaceX down here in Hawthorne, and this has flown for the past year on all the rockets that have gone up, right? So this kind of just lets you know uh, what level of manufacturing possibilities you can get to with the metal uh, laser centering process. So we're going to be talking about fused deposition modeling most of the class, so I briefly want to go over stereolithography. 
Uh, this is a functional model of the Formlabs uh, Form 1 Plus. Um, I'm going to use my, my finger as a laser, but that's okay. So, uh, first of all, the laser beam is, uh, is produced under there by those three gal galvanized sensors, and they reflect on two mirrors. Those two mirrors are actuated. I'm just going to see if I can. Yeah, okay. So these two mirrors are actuated by another motor, and they let you point the mirror wherever you want, right? And when that ultraviolet laser, right, this is ultraviolet because the resin that you're using to harden only hardens when ultraviolet light touches it. And you'll see later, but this tank, as you can see, is clear. But in, in uh, real life, this is actually uh, in a yellow container because it blocks out UV light from normal UV light from all our other light sources, right? Because if it was clear, all that UV light would end up hitting the resin and it would harden in the tank and you would never get anything, right? So when the laser trace is moved by the, by the mirror, it traces a pattern so let's say you're making something, something easy, right? You're making a circle. So the laser will be actuated by the mirror and trace that pattern. And whatever that laser hits, it solidifies. And once that first layer of that slice is solidified, that top part is moved up uh, 0.1 millimeters higher, and then the next pattern ends up being traced. And so you keep going and going until you finally get your, uh, your finalized 3D part. Right. And so, the most this right now, yes, this ends up being the most detailed. Uh, uh, it's made from a resin plastic. Um, there aren't that many colors as of right now, but uh, there's a lot of resins. They all have different properties. Some are food safe, some are not, right? But uh, usually, the manufacturer of this printer will let you know and then give you data sheets for this. But yeah, when you make uh, smaller products, right? Say if you're trying to 3D print a uh, custom Ninja nail cover, right, or a small Ninja Turtle the size of an inch, these printers unfortunately don't give you that the resolution you need for smaller things, but a stereolithography printer will. And for these, you don't see the individual layers. It, it comes out as a smooth product. So just to kind of illustrate and drive it home, we're going to watch a little video of how this works. So that's your resin. Your laser pops up from the bottom. Traces the pattern, solidifies it. You raise the model again so that you can let the resin enter the space that was just solidified and then you put it back down and then put the next layer on. You can see the layers being built one by one. The next one that I'm going to talk about is the direct metal laser sintering. This operates in basically the same manner, but upside down. So you can see here that there's two tanks here, and these are filled with a metal powder that you buy from the manufacturer, right? You have a table that actuates downward. So the way this works is the laser is on top, right? It is, uh, uh, it, it is actuated by this, uh, this mirror traces the sketch on top of the metal powder, sinters it, it's a form of uh, uh, melting, right? Sinters that first layer, this table goes down, this arm brings the powder back over it so that you have a fresh coat of powder to sinter, and then the process starts over. So we'll go to this video link again just to kind of drive that home. So notice that this is a, a large manufacturing printer.
after that, all post-processing techniques kind of mirror what you would do with regular manufacturing uh, that you'd be CNC. Holes, this is, this is an interesting part actually, so uh, let's, let's go back to what that was. Holes that usually should be threaded, right, cannot be matched at that resolution by this printer, so you have to manually tap the threads in as you see this gentleman doing, right. Uh, that is uh, actually in production in R&D to try to figure that out right now. So that it really is from end to end, you just hit print and you get what you wanted, even with threaded holes. Uh, okay. So, question. Yeah, go for the, it. For the metal person, was what we just saw, yeah. why is that now better than, I guess, before it was what, some sort of a mold? Like, if you still have to add in the thread and just different mm -hmm. finishing techniques, yeah. why not just use the mold? Why so, so, the difference is that this is called uh, an additive manufacturing technique, right? So, what that is, it's conventional manufacturing is you take a block. Right, a block of material, and then you have to cut whatever you need to, right? And you have all this wasted material, right? And you cut that as well, all this waste or whatever. And then you still have to tap your own holes, correct? But then with this, you only end up using the material that you wanted. Because you're building it. Because you're building exactly only what you need. And like you said, and then like you, you, you saw, you can pattern a matrix of objects in print 12 at a time, or 9 at a time, right? Instead of just cutting one at a time and then you just, you just save yourself a lot of time, right? So that's, that's, that's basically why. And then also, like you saw with the wrench, you can build parts that you could not make with conventional manufacturing techniques because when you are making, let's say, that part, right, you have to be able to cut it with conventional drills. And you have to be like, say, there's an internal chamber on the bottom. You can't, you can't put your drill in there. If you can't put your drill where you want to cut, you can't do it. But if you're printing it, you can, since you're slicing it by layers, you can put that internal cavity if you wanted to, right? So that's what that allows you to do that conventional manufacturing can. So the surprise here was that we uh, we three D scanned Manny Pacquiao. <laughs> <laughs> So this is this is this is another form of uh, uh, well, it's associated to 3D printing because you can 3D scan any object. You can 3D scan the cover or that case for uh, that Hero Three or your cup or, or the glasses or anything you want, and be able to copy it. Right. So the way that works is you you have your original object that you want to copy. Right. You end up putting it in front of the 3D scanner there's a line laser that covers that object and forms a point cloud. I'll talk about that later. Uh, and it creates a 3D mesh, right? This is a file that you feed the 3D printer and then out pops a copied object almost exactly as your original, right? So this is actually a workflow from one of our, uh, one of our vendors, AIO Robotics Zeus. Uh, this is what they do. It's an all-in-one printer. You have an object that can fit inside you can copy it and it makes you another one, or as many as you want. And you could modify them if you wanted to take the hat off or change the, the Brooklyn Dodgers symbol to, I don't know, maybe you're an Angels fan, right? You know, so it, it, it allows you to, to, to copy whatever you want or, you know, build and modify to, to your taste. Now, are those, is, is, they don't look at detail. I don't know if that's just the, the, the reproduction. I don't know if that's just the lighting. Yeah, I think, I think it's the lighting and these, um, uh, they have post-processing on, right. on, on the original objects, right? And they also have the natural, uh, they're weathered, so it also shows more of the different um, angles of the cut. But you can't yeah. get into detail. You can, yeah. You can, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So one way is uh, to use your Xbox Connect from your Xbox gaming system, right? That's actually a 3D scanner. So the way that works, say you have, hey, you, you love Breaking Bad, you want a uh, another Walter White, you know, bobblehead. Right? Well, it wasn't <laughs> so this piece right here, number two, is actually an infrared emitter, right? So what infrared is, 
it is uh, light at a wavelength below what the human eye can see. So that's why when you have security cameras, those emit infrared, but you can't see that light, right? So the way this works is that it shoots a pattern, a preset pattern, so you can see the holes here. So no matter what, it's always gonna shoot uh, 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 a pattern of, of, of light and create these dot matrix, right? That always, so the connect is always gonna know what those dots are, no matter what, it's the same every time, right? So it shoots those out, and then creates a dot matrix on the object that you want. So for, for sake of clarity, we're just gonna go with one of these beams, right? We'll just get rid of those two. Uh, so imagine that there's a dot on his head. That dot is gonna bounce back, right? So these two are actually stereoscopic sensors, right? These two are gonna see that dot, but since they're a set distance away from each other, they're gonna calculate the distance that each one sees. And using that distance, they can tell what the depth of that point is, right? So if you can imagine a thousand dots on him, it's gonna know where all those dots are and how far they are from the sensor and recreate that dot matrix that we mentioned earlier here, the 3D mesh, right? And through that, it'll create an object that you can end up printing, and that's what the AIO Robotics all-in-one printer does. Pretty cool stuff. And you know, you can use whatever you have. You can also find these on Craigslist. Right, if you just wanted to do it. Uh, it's, it has a USB cable. You can connect it to your printer and start off right off the bat, which is how we got manufactured. AKA Ray. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna get into the uh, nuts and bolts, like I said before. Okay, so we're all gonna put on our engineer's hats and try to create a 3D printer, right? Okay, so what's the end game, right? It's all about bottom line. What do you wanna end up with? So I wanna create plastic structure without wasting material like we mentioned before, right? How do I do that? So let's just think of, okay, well, what do we know kind of follows the same manufacturing technique? Your desktop inkjet printer, right? So it takes a piece of paper that it slides under and then prints a pattern of ink on top of it as it moves, right? So, okay, cool, that's really cool, but like, how am I gonna create a 3D structure out of that? It's like, well, okay, so what if we take that printed paper feed it back into the printer and deposit ink on top of that again. What do you get? Stack layers of ink, right? So that kind of tells you the, the, the method that this is happening, right? So, so how do we stack plastic in that pattern, right? That's, that's the question. How do we create something like that? So this is uh, a clear photo of how a typical 3D printer uh, is manufactured, right? So you have a you have to have a rigid frame because, as you can see, there are parts moving. You can't have any flexibility because if what you are printing, right, if this head moves and the structure is flexible, it'll print plastic where it shouldn't have been. And you're not going to get a detailed part like the T-Rex skull or the vase, right? It has to be very accurate. And also, to move things, we have to have electric motors in every direction. You can see this coordinate system here, right? So you break up space in three coordinates, Z being up and down, X being left to right, Y being away from you and towards you, right? So the way you do that, how do I move the printer in that direction is you put a, a motor that moves stuff in those directions and you can print or, or, or trace anything that you'd like, right? The bed down here is a heated platform so that the plastic can stick to once it's deposited. Because as we'll talk about later, some material filaments uh, they shrink when they cool, and they will literally peel off your platform and screw everything up. So you want to keep that warm, and each and each and each uh, each material wants a different temperature to stick to. So uh, when you buy your filament online or, or in person, uh, it should say on the box, or you can ask us. Uh, we have a lot of educational videos, video content, or whatever that explains it in detail. So, but but how do, how are we going to control all this? Right, we need a microcontroller board, right? This takes, and we'll talk about this later, this takes the files that you needed, that you just cut into slices, and creates a, a, a code, it's called G-code, which is the programming language that this takes, and then moves the extruder in the directions that it needs to, right? So this microcontroller board is basically the brains of the operation, okay? So let's go more in detail. So this is the chassis, now, the business end is the carriage. That top part houses 
the extruder, which we'll talk about later, this gets the plastic fed through a tube and forces it in through the nozzle. It's heated. And then that's the part that needs to move. That needs to be the most accurate part on top because you're moving that in the X direction. Right? That's the part that fits on the X direction. These are both FPM? These are, these are both FPM, correct. So now we're going to talk about toolpath, right? How do I move the, the, the nozzle, right? If I have two directions, how do I move the nozzle in the direction that I need it to? So I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, sorry. So let's say you have, I said that your Y direction is down here, right? And then your X direction is here. What if I want to print a, a wall but diagonally, right? I have motors going this way and that way. How do I, how do, I do something diagonal, right? So that means that the G code tells the extruder to move a little bit in the, the Y motors to move, let's say, this, is, this ends up being three inches, right? And the, the, it tells the X motors to move the same. Hey, I want you to move three inches as well. But at the same time that the, that the Y motors are moving. So what does that give you, right? So that gives you, this is the real movement here. This is how much it's moved, right? So if you can tell, if you, if you move the Y motors and the X motors at the same time at different, at different speeds, it will trace whatever you want, right? You can tell how much each motor has to move, and that's what the G-code tells the printer to do. Hey, it's literally just like, move X two inches at this speed, at, at X speed, whatever, and then move, while you do that, move Y three inches at Y speed, whatever. That's all it says. The printer doesn't care, it, doesn't, it, it, just, it just does what it tells it to, and that is done by the software that you run, and you don't, you don't have to worry about it, right? It does that itself, okay? And so this is kind of just a representation, right? So, so let's say we wanted to make a simple disk, a 3D printed disk, right? So this is the first layer. How is it gonna do it? So the first thing you want to do is it figures this out. It traces the outline, right? And makes two paths so that you have a hard shell. And then on the inside, it fills it in, in a pattern, right? So that ends up being the first layer. And then it goes back to the beginning. And then the Z motors, the Z motors that are pointed upward, right? They're actuated and then it goes up 0.1 millimeter and then it happens again. So that you start your second layer. And so it goes layer by layer by layer that way. So that's, that's basically the process of toolpath. Yeah, so good. so how, does the, how do you feed the extruder, right? How do you put the plastic in and, and create whatever you need, right? Because this is, this is hard plastic right now. Right? This is what's being fed in right now. It's hard, right? So the way this happens is you have a, the microcontroller that I did earlier, it feeds a voltage to the nozzle. The nozzle is heated, right? So if you have a, a metal that has a resistance and you feed voltage through it, it's gonna heat up. And that's what you want. You need to melt the plastic, right? So it melts the plastic and this extruder moves clockwise, or sorry, counterclockwise. These are geared toots, these are really sharp. It grabs in to the extruder, uh, to the filament and then pushes it down, melts it inside the nozzle and then you get the thickness that you end up wanting of the melted plastic. And so once it gets down there and hits the platform, it cools, right? Extruder motor, that's the filament and that's the nozzle. It's like, okay, cool, so where, what kind of plastic, what kind of special plastic, like, can I just, you know, melt whatever I have at home and then use that? Well, not exactly, right? So, we use thermoplastics. Now, a thermoplastic is a plastic material that melts, right? So what you want, you, it melts and becomes moldable. So once it reaches a certain temperature, it becomes almost like a liquid. You can push that through anything you want. If you just melted it, like say you put it on a frying pan and hit its temperatures, right, it would end up just becoming a liquid until you cool it, and then it just solidifies in that, right? So that's the definition of, of a thermoplastic. Now, the major ones that are most popular are PLA and ABS. Okay, so PLA, um, also known as polylactic acid, but you don't, it doesn't really matter, right? So PLA is a biodegradable plant-based plastic, okay? If you give it enough time, it will degrade again. You can, you can make compost out of it if you wanted to, right? Yes. Do not, yeah, no, don't do that, because yeah, it'll eat it, and yeah, that's not what you want. So anyway, <laughs> so the nozzle that we just spoke about, right? 
the temperatures for each plastic is different. Each material is different because they have different uh, molecular constituents, right? So for PLA, you want to be between 185 and 210. This is the stuff that you feed the software. But normally when you buy, say, this idea printer, it already knows what the temperatures are for the plastic. You just say, hey, this is PLA. Idea printer is like, okay, cool. I know everything about it. Just give me the file, right? But if you were doing it yourself, you, you, you input these things, right? And then the platform temperature for that is 60. So PLA is the easiest to print, right? It's the basic one. When you buy a 3D printer, you get PLA with it because it's, it's, uh, 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 it lets you learn on it, right? Uh, the downside is that PLA is a little brittle. Um, it can break easily, right? Um, but these are PLA, so... Even this one is kind of flexible. Right, so, so that's the level of flexibility you get with PLA, but other plastics flex way more. Or others are tougher and won't let you play with it, but they're not brittle, they're not gonna break, right? Uh, like ABS, so ABS is not biodegradable. ABS plastic you can find in your pipes at home, right? If they're not copper, they're ABS, right? Uh, engineers like ABS because it's machinable, it's easily machinable. You can take a lake or like a drill tool, you can take a Dremel to it and easily carve it if you wanted to, right? Uh, but it can be finicky to print. Like I mentioned earlier, if your platform isn't heated and you print on it, if, and it's open like this idea printer is, if there's a cold draft and it cools too fast, the edges are gonna get colder first and those are gonna peel up and you will have a deformed part and you'll have to restart your print, right? So you have to know what you're doing with ABS. So we generally advise you to start with PLA and then go to ABS once you kind of know what you're doing a little bit, right? But that can be controlled easily, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, totally. So this one actually has a door to prevent drafts. Is this, we're printing ABS right now. So if we, if we close the door, we don't have to worry about drafting or anything like that. And the, the, the printer bed is heated. So that's how you control against that. Yeah. Good point. Sorry, I said we're moving on. Yeah. That's it. That's all that you can do with the FD. Those are the only materials. So no, no, no. There are, there are, there's a huge range. There are some that are food safe, right? There are others that are harder, right? There are others that actually have components of other stuff, like uh, wood. Uh, wood. Metal. You can do uh, carbon fiber, right? Uh, for really light, light and really strong pieces, right? Others are very flexible, like I mentioned earlier. There's rubbers. There's nylon, right? These are just the, the main two, the most popular that you start off with. And then once you kind of get a grasp of everything, you can you know, figure out how to print others because you realize that, hey, this new one has to print at a different temperature. If you started off with that, you wouldn't know that, right? So yeah, these, these, these are your starters. PLA and ABS, is, they're both the gateway drugs to other types of uh, right. materials for 3D printing. Right. Yeah, totally. And question, the, yeah. the 3D dress that we saw yes. before, yes. like probably a nylon? Nylon, yep. yes, that's right. Would this be FDM? Or? FDM, correct. Yeah, totally. And then it, it's cool because when that was printed, it was actually printed folded. And then they unfolded it out oh, because right. it had to fit inside the volume. Was that, that was the PLA. Oh no, I thought you said it was ABS. Correct. Yeah, this is ABS. Uh, this is uh, on PLA. Oh, the printer itself can. Take. They can do either or, yeah. uh, but this is right now the sound is printing and they have to do an yeah. ABS and this prints in PLA the only that we have. And they right. can do nylon. They can do nylon if you want. Okay. So Anything. Can yeah. Want. Totally. Can, can FDM do metal? So FDM can, can use plastics that have metal components, okay. but they will not be metallic, right? Like so. Metallic light. They'll be metallic light. Metallic? Right, so they'll be denser, they'll be heavier, right? Okay. And you can, they'll be, uh, uh, if you use certain types of iron, it might be magnetic. Or you can pass a voltage to it if you wanted, if it was copper or brass or something. But it's not going to act like pure copper. It's not pure brass because it's, it's, it's met metal pieces suspended in plastic. It's not full on metal, right? If you wanted real metal, you have to go to direct metal laser sintering. So it, just, you could, it wouldn't even appear to be metal? No, no, it would appear to it, it yeah. Would appear like it would look like it. Would look like it. Totally. That would kind of look, yeah. it would look like a metal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. With Yeah. But, and, but a way around it is using the resin based one, the stereolithography, right? You create the actual thing that you want, right? And you can actually put that in wax, create a mold, and in that mold, right, you can create, uh, you, you put in, uh, uh, sorry, melted metal, and then you can create the actual metal piece of it that you just prototyped in the resin. Right. So there's ways around it to create metal parts if you want. Right. Yeah. Instead of having. 
form labs is resin. That's the same thing. It's just like a resin is the liquid that we saw earlier. I saw it. Right. And then for those, sorry, I just want to get the material. No, no, go for it. <laughs> so for the stereolithography yeah. printing, it's just form labs. No, no, no. So, so there are other ones. I just listed the popular oh, ones. Yeah, totally. And then direct metal, it's just metals, or there's others that you can use? Uh, they're mostly metals, but it's a huge, it's a wide variety of metals that you can do there. Yeah. So the most popular are like your Inconel, which is what that rocket motor was, was made out of, right? Um, then you can also do uh, aluminums or aluminum alloys, anything that you end up wanting. You buy the, you buy the powder from the uh, manufacturer, right? Yeah. But those are metals all the way through. Doing it here. Yeah. Okay, so for stereolithography versus FDM, yes. since they can both take such a large variety, I mean, I understand the differences between the types, mm -hmm. well, I mean, between how the machines work themselves and how the printing is done. Yeah. But as far as just from a, you know, just from a user standpoint, not from an engineer standpoint, which would I choose in which situation? Is one of them just prohibitively expensive and that's why? Okay, so, so stereolithography is a little more expensive, but not crazy. It's maybe like 50% more expensive than your FDM machine, okay? What I would want to use stereolithography for is smaller objects, right? Oh, it's the detail. Right. Okay. Cool. And then also there's ways to get rid of the layering on uh, FDM printed parts, right? You can actually take acetone or basically nail polish remover. If it's ABS, it will smooth it out. Or you can put it in a box full of uh, uh, that chemical and the vapors will kind of melt it over a period of hours and it'll just smooth it out and you can't see the layers. So you can, you can go either way. Okay, so. So what's the design process, right? Like as an end user, right? What do I need to do to be able to create and end up with a 3D printed part that I wanted to, right? So you have to go through, so these are the basic steps, right? Like re just really basic. Model creation, you literally design or build or download your part. Then you have to slice it in a slicing software because you can tell that these are all layers, right? So the slicing software De determines what those layers and what the printer needs to do to be able to have those layers, right? And then after that, it creates the G-code, right? That it, it just, you can upload that to the printer via cable, or you can put it on like memory stick and it'll take a memory stick and it'll just print on your own, like this one is, right? Or, well, that one is, right? So, let's talk about model creation, right? Uh, there's three major types. Uh, there's two types of CAD. One's parametric. I'll explain what the differences are here after. Uh, parametric and non-parametric. And then there's also websites like Thingiverse. It's a database, it's, a, it's an easy to use website of just 3D printed, uh, well sorry, models that someone else created that you can just download and feed to your slicer and then print it like whatever you want, like that T-Rex one. So we got that off Thingiverse and then they sliced it in the software and then printed it and then that's what we got, right? It's, it's pretty cool. So, but the, but the major thing here is that it outputs an STL file. Your slicer has to get an STL file. That's what your software outputs. So you, you, you put in your model and then you get an STL file and then we go to the next step, right? So parametric modeling. Uh, this is what people think about usually when you think about computer-aided design, that's CAD, right? So the difference is that you can see here that there's a history back here. That's because the creation of a parametric model mimics the, uh, uh, the manufacturing tech, uh, conventional manufacturing technique that's gonna be ended up using to make this. So what I mean by that is, if we have a cube again, right? We have a cube again, and then we wanted to make that flange, right? What do we have to do? It's like, okay, well, you know, I can uh, cut this part off, right? And so this part comes off, and you have that angle. Like, okay, cool, well, what else do I need to do, right? I need to cut a hole here, and a hole here, and then that's what, that's what that history tree is. That's, that's the exact, that's the exact thing right here. You cut the first one, and then the next part is, is based on that cut, right? I want to put holes in the, part, in, the, in the portion of that model that I just cut. No, this is not G-code yet, this is CAD, right? So uh, this is mainly used by engineers to design parts, right? Uh, because all these dimensions 
uh, and relationships that are based on each other, right? Some of these uh, fold positions are based on another dimension that you created, right? Um, they're used by engineers and other people that are just learning the software to do stress analysis. Hey, this thing that, I, that I'm printing, if I hold it a certain way, is it gonna break, right? Who knows? But you can find out really well using one of these programs like SolidWorks or Katia or Pro Engineer or something, right? Uh, also thermally, are you gonna put it in a heated environment? Don't know. You can find out and then, and then know if it's gonna melt or not. And that's what this is down here. This is a, this is a stress plot of a certain part. This is a brake disc, or actually a, 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 a brake hub. Break hub. Right? So you can tell all the, all the stress is being up here and it's gonna tell you, hey, this is how much it's gonna bend. You better put more material there so it doesn't bend. Right? Pretty cool stuff. How can we just, you know, not Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cool. How can, I mean, is it like some sort of simple or it, it can be. It can be easy. Sort of totally, yeah. So there's other websites that are free, first of all, right? There's Sol, uh, what's Google SketchUp? SketchUp. There's Google SketchUp, right? It's really simple. You just take uh, 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 objects and then you, you, you put them together and then they'll cut the way you want. It's really simple, really basic. It, I, I know this looks really intimidating, yeah. but it's pretty simple once you get into it because there's tutorials online. You can watch YouTube, it's really easy. But I'm saying for like a stress analysis, thermal analysis. Oh, that stuff? Then, that you, you kind of have to know what you're doing. And then there's a lot of tutorials there that you have to spend time going through. We can teach it to you too. Yeah, we can, we can do it too. But I'll, like, like, I said, like I said at the bottom, it's easier than it looks, but you just have to have the time to invest in learning about it. It's not that bad. So this is parametric. For non-parametric, This right, is what you'd probably be more interested in, ZBrush. There's no history in here. You can think of it as a ball of clay, right? Hey, I want to put my thumb on this ball of clay and create this indentation, right? And then that, that's basically what this was. You can create an indentation on something and then, or, or take pieces out, right? Or melt the clay however you'd like. This works like Photoshop, right? This is more of a creative, type of application that you can use, okay? Um, and this, this I kind of just put in to, to, to give you the level of detail that you can achieve by using this, right? You can cut, move, form stuff as if it was clay, right? And then end up with these awesome models. And then you can also have articulated pieces, right? And then that means that these are pieces that move within each other that are printed as one piece if you'd like to, right? And then make this model like, like that robot that you see there on the side. So. Uh, for that, you can use Rhino 3D. Rhino 3D is uh, free. There's Maya. Maya is not free. Uh, Rhino 3D is for PC? Uh, actually, these are, these are all Mac and, and PC. Is free? Yeah. Rhino, Rhino 3D is free. Cool. Yeah, pretty cool. And then, and then there's like a wealth of knowledge. There's like YouTube tutorials and stuff you can teach yourself. It's really easy, right? But to get to, to this level of skill will take some time, right? Obviously, but uh, those are the two kinds of things. And you can export that .stl file that the slicer is going to need later to create the G code for the printer. Either of them give you a .stl file. Any of these have uh, give you the option. Yeah. So this is cool because um, a lot of animators, right? A lot of um, you know people who, who are in the movie industry or some sort of creative industry use non-parametric modeling to actually create characters and different types of animation. And Mitchell actually. Uh, he has a friend that is uh, that, that wants to create uh, 3D printed uh, models that, that uses the non-parametric uh, software. Yeah, so my background is in animation to manage um, artists, showrunners, and I actually just had a meeting with the next client of mine that works at Stupid Buddy. Stupid Buddy <laughs> does um, robot chicken. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stop motion um, animated shows out there, and they actually just purchased a bunch of SLA Machines. Sailor pocket machines. Mm -hmm. And so uh, right now, in the stop motion animation industry, they're using Maya uh, and animation, 3D animation, they use Maya. And now they want to start creating basically toys. Because when you're an animator, when we were at Art Institute, these, uh, a lot of students, a lot of animators want to create actual tangible models of their, um, characters. Of their characters. And now it allows them to create toys and prototypes. And so, in the animation industry now, it's uh, it's awesome for now for pitching. So if you're pitching a show, it's easier for you now to create a 3D model of your character and pitch it to a producer rather than just 2D, you know, rendition. You said that they purchased SLA printers. Is that stereo yes. photography? Yeah.
Cool. So let's say you, you use either of these CAD programs and then you get the STL file, right? What do you do with it? So you put it in your program called a slicer, right? Now, there are free slicers that can drive any 3D printer, right? Uh, like your Repetier host, which I'll show you right after the slide. Or there's other slicers that come with the printers because they already wrote the software specifically for that printer. Now, I would recommend against using a software piece that's specifically safe for the idea printer to run the up mini, right? Because, you know, that software was written specifically for this printer. But, uh, but yeah, so what that literally does is, like I, I, I keep mentioning it, right? like let's say we have that base. Excuse my drawing skills. What this slicer will do is literally, like you feed it certain, certain parameters, right? Like, hey, I want each layer to have a height of uh, 0.1 millimeters, right? And then the slicer is like, okay, cool. Let me make, let me, let me just do it. So it'll slice it and create patterns of thicknesses of that layer height that you fed, right? You can go down to 0.25 on really good, oh, sorry, 0.025 on really good FDM printers. SLA, you can go down to 0 0.005 if you wanted to, the really good ones, right? So it'll, it'll do it like that. But say, say that you have a part that if you print like this, uh, let's say it has a dongle here, right? It's, it's uh, hanging off the top wall. If this printer is gonna start printing from the bottom up, how is it gonna print that? Because there's gonna, there's gonna be a slice of a piece here hanging, right? How's he gonna do that? Okay, well you have to realize that and you feed it to a slicer in a different orientation. Like, hey, I want you to print this thing upside down. And the slicer's like, okay, cool, here you go. So it slices it and in that way, this part where it connects to the wall is the first part that it prints. And in that way, it ends up putting it, putting it in the part. Because otherwise this way, this will just fall down and not be connected when it gets to the top. So you have to think about these things when you're putting it in the slicer. And you can even put them at an angle if you want. The slicer will figure it out and then create the G-code that you feed to the printer. Right. So Joe, can you uh, explain to us how, uh, what, what's the correlation between the slicer and then the G-code and how, do, how does the interaction between two software happen? The slicer between, okay, so... Uh, Is it just a automatically into G-code, how does that process happen? So when you open your Slicer app, it asks you for these parameters that I, that I mentioned earlier, right? And then you load in the dot, your, your file, which is the document, right? So what the Slicer ends up doing is, some Slicers, like right into your host, I actually have, I have it up right now, I should. So Repetier host is different because it's different because um, it's a host and a slicer, which means that you can put in the STL file that you want, and it'll run your printer instead of just giving the file which you're going to give to the printer uh, by itself. So let me just. Uh, Okay, so we're just gonna have to do without it. So, in Repetier Host, right, it lets you select uh, certain printers that you've already connected to the computer, right? It identifies your printer. Say that's your uh, mini, right? It identifies it. It already knows how to talk to it, right? Because there are certain parameters that, hey, like if I say, move your X motor 0.1 millimeters on this one, it's gonna take different code than for this one. It just depends on how they were made, right? So Repetier host is gonna know. So you load, uh, you connect to your printer, and then you end up loading your actual STL file, right? 
and then you tell it to slice with those parameters, and in another window, it gives you the actual code, right? You can see the code by itself. And so all, all you do is there's a, there's a button that says, hey, run this, and it'll run. What does host do again? What does Repetir host So Repetir host is a slicer. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then it also runs any printer that you'd like. It reads the file, right? The STL file. Yeah, so it takes the STL file, right? It slices it the way you wanted it to. Okay. And then actually, uh, it tells the printer how to run by itself. Like you can run any printer with Repetir host. Other slicers only give you the, sli the, the slicing G code. It only gives you the G code, yeah, but yeah. it can't run the printer. You have to find out how to put that code in the printer your own, on yourself, right? Like, oh, okay, let me put that copy, uh, sorry, drag the G code onto a, a mini SD card. And I'll put that on the printer and then it'll run. Right? But Repetir Host can do whatever you want. Like, you can run it by itself if you wanted to. And the cool thing with Repetir Host is it actually tells you, um, it gives you a graph of the temperatures, right? Say something messed up and your platform isn't heating anymore, right? You'd see that line come down. Like, oh, okay, hey, something messed up. With other slicers, or if you're using an SD card, you don't know what the temperatures are, right? And sometimes you want to watch that because, hey, maybe you're trying a new material and you have to make sure that it's at a certain temperature, right? So that's what Repetir Host is, and, and, it's, and it's completely free, right? It asks for a donation, but you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, so that's what Repetir Host does. And our model is done. Even before we even finish the class, look at that. Oh, nice. So you. You took a piece of, uh, what was it, uh, material, the ABS material, right? It was a piece mm -hmm. of paper. Oh, so, no, so the paper was, was, was to make sure that the nozzle was at a certain height. Oh, it was just to, it was uh, because to calibrate. Yeah. Calibrate. Yeah. yeah. So the plastic yeah. bag is the plastic bag. Oh, the plastic bag. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>